Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 11 of 20-something Live. Um, today, we will have two different companies on. We'll have three guests, as usual, but two companies. Um, both have started in a touring realm, I would say, um, one of which has led to a buyout, and the other of which is still getting their feet just wet, which is awesome. Um, so our first guest today, which we'll get to in a second, is going to be Sebastian Solano. He's one of the founders of Life in Color. Many of you probably know them for their absolutely outrageously successful and amazing paint parties, formerly known as Dayglow. And then we will have Jack Shannon and Deuce Devenow from Recess, who have recently really found their niche in creating a very cool startup educational touring platform that is going to be on a college campus near you soon. And let's just jump right into it here, first off with Sebastian. What's up, brother? What's going on, man? Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. How you doing? Perfect, perfect. I'm great. I'm great. Excited. You're, you're at that wonderful pad in Miami right now, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly I've right. Been, I've been there once. There was like tons of beautiful women all around, and it was just <laughs> during the ultra madness. You guys know how to party. Yeah, it, it is what happens in, the, in this place quite often, but especially during that week, you know, with everybody being here, we, and, it, and it's right in front of Ultra, actually, literally, so we always have a little party over here. And who all lives there? It's actually uh, Lucas and Patrick, uh, my business partners. Okay, and, then, and those are... Go ahead, what, what was the question? Those are three of the four founders? Yeah, yeah, those, those are two out of the four founders. And, okay. then, and then their friend Petey lives here as well. This, this condo happens to be right in front of our, our office, so I just came out here to just do this so that way I can get away from the noise that happens in our office. Cool. And how many employees do you guys have now? Whew. Right now, there is about 23 people inside of our office. Wow. And then, and then I think worldwide, we're just, just, a, just, just around 35. Cool. So is that a qualification to do what you do to know how to throw a great party? Of course, man. It, it doesn't matter what position you have in our company. you you got to have partying in your blood. Cool. So talk to me how it all started. Um, basically, we, we were in college at uh, Florida State in Tallahassee. You know, we're all proud, proud Seminoles. And, and one day, like, they invited us to this, like, paint party called Dayglow. This is, like, I don't know, freaking 2006, you know? And I was like, what do you mean a paint party? They were like, yeah, it's this party where everybody wears all white and people throw paint all over each other. And I couldn't get I couldn't get my head wrapped around it at all. But they said, look, it's gonna be wild. Everybody's gonna be throwing paint all over each other. And and that for a college kid just sounded like freaking the greatest thing in the world. So I said, okay, I, I'm gonna go check it out. And then I walk in, and it's like it was like a house party of like 200 people, and literally everybody was wearing white, and people were throwing paint all over each other. And obviously it was like neon colored paint. And then what was really cool about it is that there was house music blasting the whole time. And normally, you know, back in 2006 in Tallahassee, house music wasn't that big. So it, I was like, and, and we were already huge uh, dance music fans. So for me to walk into this party and, and just see that vibe of like people going wild to dance music, but then throwing paint all over each other, I was just like, wow, like this is the, this is the greatest thing I've... It was honestly, I, up to that moment, probably the greatest experience of my life. So I was already in the, in the business of throwing parties, and I was a huge fan of Sensation White. So it kind of just clicked, man. I put, you know, two and two, and then I said, you know what? This, this could be, like, the sensation of America, like, with our culture and, and how crazy, like, people like to get in college. I was like, this, this should be a touring event. And then I started looking into the research, like who started it, blah, blah, blah. There was really no like official like creator, founder, nothing, you know. Um, so, so then we kind of just said, so you know who, what? So who's, whose party was it then? Well, it, at the moment, it, it was a fraternity party. It was okay. like a fraternity sorority event. That, that, that's what we used to do it back in the days. So it was like fraternities and sororities doing it in Tallahassee. It was like a Tallahassee thing, like a tradition over there, right? And... So I even went to like different fraternities. I'm like, look, I'm looking for the first guy that did this. I have this crazy idea. I want to bring him on with me as a partner. And everybody was like, dude, to be honest, just just go do your thing because nobody <laughs> really cares. <laughs> I was like, all right. So m myself and you know Lucas, Patrick, and Paul, we got together, <clears throat> and then we started. Like, it's kind of crazy because even from day one, we we had the vision that it was gonna go to where it's at today. You know, we obviously had no idea. 
how crazy it was going to be, uh, you know, everything we went through, and, and at some point, how, how quick it was all going to happen, you know, but I always had in my mind that we were going to fill out a stadium with amazing production, performers, the best DJs in the world, and just literally covering everybody in paint. Like, that was always the vision, you know, and... And I guess throughout the years, we went from, you know, selling out nightclubs to then jumping into arenas. And, and then next thing you know, like today, you know, we're in uh, 55 countries right now. And by next year, we plan on being on, uh, I think, close to 80 countries. Every, in every continent, we're going to do a show next year. So, I mean, yeah, it's, wow. it's, it has grown, you know, immensely. And, and we're very thankful for, for, for the success. Did you throw shows prior to Dago? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and we still do. We still do, do shows outside of, uh, you know, Dago Life in Color. Um, we, we used to do just club events, you know, like run out a nightclub, you know, book a, you know, a small DJ and, and try to sell it out. But we, we would just do it based on the experience, you know, because we, we, in, that, in that point, the DJs weren't that big, you know, like it wasn't that easy to sell out a venue based on a DJ. So we would just say, look, come party with us. You know, we used to, you know, we, we used to call ourselves the committee. You know, come party with the committee, and everybody wanted to party with the committee because we just threw the craziest parties, and that was really our sales point. You know, so that's kind of where we got like the throwing parties thing, like, and that's how actually my brother David Solano, how he became a DJ. He was the DJ of the committee, and myself, Paul, Lucas, and Patrick were the promoters. You know, so and we were all used to live in the same house, and 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 we used to gather around a big table and decide what was our next party, and that's how the like the name the committee came. You know, um, which is actually still a company that was also sold to SFX. So, so yeah, man. So that that's kind of how it all came about. Cool. So I, I every email that I send, I sign the signature. Ideas are a dime a dozen. You know, just a, only worth ten cents. But those who put them into practice are priceless. And I think there's really cool. You know, part of twenty something is finding those entrepreneurs that did it at such a young age. But sometimes. You know, you get that idea, as I'm sure a lot of people watching today, and then they have trouble figuring out those first steps to execute. So obviously that's why it was so important for me to ask, had you been throwing shows prior, yeah. what were some of the first things you did once you realized there was no founder, the Dayglo Life and Color, to make it your own and starting to grow it from being something that was really local in Florida to taking it nationally? Because I remember I was in college at the time, and I just remember how quickly it seemed like it was happening, which maybe it wasn't as quick as it felt to me, but... Um, obviously, the rise was, uh, I think, a lot faster than other theme parties. And also, what do you think made Dayglo Life and Color so unique that it was able to kind of rise so quickly? Okay, um, great question, by the way. So I'll start with the first part. Um, the, the first thing we did, once I knew that nobody really, you know, claimed to own the event or whatever, is obviously, you know, we, we trademarked, you know, the name Dayglo, which obviously eventually... No, you trademarked we were... it, but you didn't, you didn't patent it. Yeah, we tried patenting it, and then you find out we found out you couldn't patent it. You can't patent a paint party. I guess that's just not something that's patentable. Yeah, because I figured so, the, the patent would be worth more than the trademark if oh, it was absolutely. Yeah. I 100 percent agree with you. But so we were not able to do that. So we said, you know what? Let, let's trademark the name Dayglo, and then let's let's start Dayglo Tour. So we trademarked the name, and then we created a website. Uh, Lucas actually did it, and the website was bas basically uh, a map of the state of Florida. And then I started making phone calls to promoters and be like, look, this party's crazy. We need to bring this party to your city. We own it, this and that. And as soon as they would say, they would say okay, I'm down, we would put a paint splatter on the city. So next thing you know, within four or five months, you would go on our website and we looked like a big deal even though we were nothing. You know? <laughs> so, and what, that, were the that deals that, what were the deals that you would make with those promoters? We would just partner with them. 50-50? Uh, 50 50 which is which is not what we do anymore but at the moment yeah so we partnered 50 50 at some point uh, we were so sure of the success of it that we would say we'll we'll do like 60 40 but we'll put up all the money and all the risk because we knew that that party was just gonna sell out we just needed them to promote it because obviously we didn't have the access to the local network and then we needed them to help us find the right venue um, and it's funny a lot of these promoters are still our promoters today you know like are still our partners today because we, we have built great long-term relationships but Going back to your question, like starting this, a big part of it was like already making yourself look like you were something, you know, even though we were really nothing, you know. Um, I would even call people, like, because I, I would find people throwing like their own dig. I would call them, be like, listen, I'm coming after you. You don't even know, blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, <laughs> sometimes we even got royalties and we didn't even own the trademark yet. It was kind of funny, you know. 
But that whatever. was to the I mean, people that were doing it that were making paint parties to look like your parties. Yeah, once once they started noticing our party in different cities, even though we were still very small and didn't even have a trademark approved, we, we started seeing day glows popping up. So we would call them and we would send them letters. And then we actually got two of them to pay us royalties, even though we didn't even own it. You know? <laughs> so it's it's just like straight up like we, we did take ownership of of the concept of the brand. And we wanted to become the Red Bull, you know, before anybody else came up. So just like energy drinks, there's 50 of them, right? But Red Bull is Red Bull, and nobody will ever touch them. And, th and that was our goal, because we knew competition was going to come. But we said, if we, if we come first, if we build the relationships with all the artists, and we build the relationships with the venues, and with our fans, most importantly, then, I mean, we have events where we have our life in color, and then, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes away, there's another paint party. Theirs is ten bucks. Ours is eighty dollars a ticket, and we get fifteen thousand people, and they get a hundred people. You know, it's because we've we, we've built a, a brand that people recognize, and that was kind of our goal at the beginning. We we weren't really making money, even though we looked like we were. We were not making any money at all. It was just let's just get the brand established. Let's get into as many cities as possible, and become rebel. And and that was sort of our strategy at the beginning. And then after that, you know, you work on expansion and and all those type of things that you as a business. You know, you got to start working on becoming more a business. But yeah, that, that's kind of how I started. And then I think your other question was about the uniqueness, right? Yeah, the uniqueness, and I think it's the uniqueness of why the theme worked and also building off of that. What did you do when you saw these competitors come up that weren't using your name? Was it just a sign that you guys were doing something right? Or, you know, how did you, how did you look at the competition? Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I mean, you said it yourself, you know. People only hate when you're doing something right. People only copy you when you're doing something right. You know? So, yeah, when, when we started to see these copycats come up, yeah, the first thing I thought, I was like, you know, they, they want to be like us. You know, they, they want to try to claim what we've created and, and, and turn it into, you know, to their favor or whatever. Um, but one thing that we, very, we always stayed clear with, clear with is, like, we're going to stick to our plan, you know? So even though there's like somebody else coming up, it doesn't mean that because they did an event that we have to now change our party and we have to change our strategy. And a lot of people do that when they see competition. And, and I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is that you got to focus on you, on your event, on your company, and not let competition like determine your strategy or your direction. Because then that's when you start playing in their ball court, you know? We always were the ones determining the, determining the direction of where our company was going. Yes, you have to look at what's going on out there. You have to look from uh, look at the competition. You got to learn from your competition, you know. But you gotta you gotta stay stay clear to your plan, you know. And you can't let those things veer you right or veer you left because oh they did this and it worked, so now we got to do this to top them. Like no, if we have a plan and we know our plan, at the end of the day, is gonna get us to that ultimate goal. We just we just keep going, you know. And I feel like that, that, that was, you know, something that we always, you know, it was, it was part of our plan always. Like, don't let the other competition, you know, decide how, what a party becomes. And that helped us a lot. And then the other thing is, obviously, you know, we've always been so much more advanced than everyone else. I mean, we've spent literally, I mean, I can tell you, over $1.5 million developing ways of shooting paint, you know. And that's how, you know, we started with little, you know, squirt guns to, like, now paint cannons, you know, paint guns that shoot, like, fire hoses, um, we have some new stuff coming up that I can't really talk about yet, but you guys are going to see it hopefully by the end of this year, if not by next year, that's going to change the game, you know, for sure. Um, so it's that, and then it's like our production, the way we treat our artists, you know, like we make sure that, you know, we don't want to be one of those brands that's like only about the brand and like the DJ is just a guy playing. Like we want to make sure that the artist feels the love, you know, from, from us, that he understands that, and we understand that the party is, is not just only about the concept, but it's about the concept, the fans, and and give in providing a great time for the fans. You know, with a great artist. You know, the music is extremely important. You know, and and some concepts and some event brands like they try to make it seem like they're the only ones that matter. You know, but they still go out and book everybody. You know, we we actually make sure that we we have a great relationship with the artists, with the agents, with the managers. Um, and then when it comes to the fan experience, I mean, our production. If you compare it to like other pain parties out there, I mean, you can see it's it's. I mean, you can't even compare it. And then also the professionalism when you deal with the venues. We've never had a stadium or an arena say your party was way too crazy. 
you guys were way too messy. There's yeah, I was going to ask work. about that. Isn't you know how did you guys learn how to clean that up? I mean, dude, it, it, it's definitely a, a crazy trial and error, man. I mean, when we started, it was in nightclubs. So now it's funny. It's easier to do a million dollar production at a stadium than a fifty thousand dollar party at a club. It's just so much easier because in the nightclubs where we started, we literally turned the nightclub into a giant trash bag. So, and actually myself, like Lucas, Patrick, Paul, like the founders were climbing on ladders, you know, stapling tarp on the walls, like, you know, falling on our ass, you know, cutting ourselves, <laughs> trying to prep the venue, you know. It would take us two days to, to grab a, a nightclub and turn it into a trash bag. So, as, as the time went by, we started noticing, you know what, this paint is really like amazing like it comes off this surface this other texture you don't want to mess with it we started learning what's good what's bad what, what type of surfaces we can work with and then once we went to an arena it's when the game changed because we realized that arenas you don't have to cover anything you know because the paint is never gonna hit the ceilings or the walls and then our paint the paint that we have is like it's 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 washable water-based non-toxic comes off everything so it's it's really harmless even on the seats so the only thing that we do now with the arenas is just we, we put a carpet for the fans' safety. We don't even do it because we have to. We do it because we, we don't want our fans to be slipping. And, and then we have a cleaning crew that comes, comes after and, and cleans out the venue. You know, there's, there's a little more details into it, but that's, in all reality, I mean, it was years of like, okay, this works, this doesn't work, this type of venue won't work. We did, you know, have some hiccups, but... But, but yeah, I mean, and, and it's crazy because when you approach, like, picture your, like, Manhattan Center or the Shrine in L.A., you know, like, like big venues like that, you approach them and you say, uh, I want to throw a paint party in your, in your venue. They're going to look at you and it'll be like, you're crazy. Like, why would I ever allow this here? You know? So that's always the, what we get from everybody. But then as we come, we, we have a special presentation for the venues that shows video of how we do our stuff, how we prep, you know, the, the professionalism. I feel like all those things weigh in, and then they're like, and then they look us up, and they're like, "All right, this guys are legit." I mean, if they're doing it in you know 50 countries throughout the world in all the major stadiums and arenas, then then I'm sure they do a good job, you know. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it's just with time, you know, we build that credibility and we present ourselves like we're credible, you know, from the beginning, and then that right. way that, that helps us a lot. Yeah, perception is reality. You talk about 100%. that website with the paint spots on very early yeah. on. I want to remind the audience, you guys can ask questions at any time just by hashtagging 20-something live, and Sebastian and I will get right to them. All right, Sebastian, my next question is, it was a couple years ago now that you guys found out that you could no longer use the name, that you had built up all this credibility and brand rapport. And obviously you four, the name being Daglo, of course, and obviously you four being the leaders behind and the founders behind this business were the ones that knew how to recreate a brand and we're really the individuals representing the brand. And it was around the same time that I'd say the brand, I don't think it's reached maturity yet in America, but it was starting to, you know, there's the day glow party was everywhere at that point. So now all of a sudden out of nowhere, you have to switch your brand name. You guys pick an incredible name in life and color. But at first, when I first heard it, I'm like, I don't know if we're going to be able to pull that off. But you guys did it, and you did it with flying colors, no pun intended. So how did you do it? Was it an easy switch? Uh, was it heartbreaking? Did you guys just put your best foot forward? Go walk us through the process. You, you know what, man? Like, first of all, you have some amazing questions, by the way. Um, that Thank was you. probably like the toughest thing that we've ever had to deal with in our lives, you know, uh, from a business standpoint. I mean, when first of all, it, it, it's a two-way like punch in the face. First of all, it's like, yeah, we, we have already invested millions of dollars tons of marketing, I mean, going to all these cities, I mean, absolutely all of our resources into a name that we couldn't use anymore, you know? And then the second thing, it's kind of like somebody coming and tell you that your son that you've had for four or five years that you call, you know, Chris, his name's not Chris anymore. You got to come up with a new name for him, you know? So it, it, it was like heartbreaking in so many different ways. Like, I couldn't even tell you, man. Like, when we went through that, I mean, we contemplated so many different things. I mean, we, fuck, man, I, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it, was, it was just nuts just thinking about those days again right now, you know? And, I mean, the process of coming up with a new name was even worse because then you got to think about a name that not only sounds good and fits what you're doing, 
and that's not cheesy, but then also one that you can protect and that already doesn't have trademarks and, and already all types of things that you're going to have to come back and deal with it again a year later. So, I mean, it, it, was, <clears throat> it was days. I mean, we were up to like, I mean, 6, 7 a.m., you know, the four, par the four partners. We would invite creative people in the room. I mean, we would, I, I mean, it was the craziest process in the world. It was not easy. But you know what? I remember one day we were sitting down and we were like, guys, the four of us, we stuck together. We created this and we put all of our minds to it and that's why this happened. So if we do the same thing towards this name change, like it's, there's nothing that's going to take us down, you know? So we started coming up with names and like I said, everything sounded bad and cheesy. Um, Life in Color wasn't the first name we went for. There was a few of them that we tried to go for first, but we couldn't get them trademarked. So then eventually... We narrowed down a few that, that were possible. And actually, I'll be honest, I didn't like Life in Color. I, I voted against Life in Color, you know? Um, but it ended up being a phenomenal name. Like you said, at the beginning, you weren't feeling it either. Yeah, you know? I, I thought it was always going to be known as Dayglow. I remember being on the bus with Matt Meyer and Samson and thinking, that, hey, guys, you know, it's Dayglow. It's not Life in Color. And they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, everyone's still referring to it as Dayglow. And over time... I don't know whether it was the money or the branding or, or what it was, but over time, my brain has become triggered now to really think of it only as life and color, which is incredible. It's very difficult to do that. I, I agree, man, and, and thank you for saying that because that, that was our biggest thing. We were like, you know what? I'm okay with, if our fans still call us Dayglo because in my heart, you know, we're Dayglo. I'll be honest, just like you, in my heart, we're life and color now. I'm, I'm over it. Yeah, it's know? interesting. Yeah, cool. it, 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 it is crazy. But then we also said, you know what? It, it's not too much, I think, about the name that we come up with. It's about how we brand and present the name to our audience and how do mm -hmm. we sell it. If we believe in it and we sell it properly, our fans are going to follow us, you know? But it is crazy because, you know, picture of, like, Cruella or, or Tiesto. Suddenly, Cruella can't call himself Cruella or Tiesto can't call himself Tiesto anymore. Like, how is he going to sell tickets? How are people going to know, oh, that's Tiesto? You know, especially, and you know, and, and social media is getting, it's made it a lot easier, but still, man, it, it, it was crazy. Like our first tour with our new name, we were like sweating balls before we put out, we went on sale. Like it was, it was nerve wracking, but, but like you said, thank God it worked out. And honestly, like it, it's probably the biggest business challenge that we've had, all had in our lives. And after surpassing that, and I think in a very successful way, um, I think it, it made us stronger, man. It, it let us know that there's nothing's going to take us down, you know, and, and, and that's, that's a good feeling to have. Definitely. Have you guys had any issues with obviously the surmounting DJ fees and needing to book A-list artists? I know a lot of other buyers have talked about for their festivals how that's created issues for them and, and affected their profitability in numerous ways. Um, how has that affected you guys? And because you have a theme party, does it not affect you as much? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it, it affects us just as bad as the major, as, as the major festivals because um, the agents know that Life in Color sells a lot of tickets, you know? So it's not like you're, you're booking an artist and you're like, oh, yeah, the capacity is 5,000, 10,000, but, it, you know, it's not for sure going to do that. Like, agents think, oh, it's, it's Life in Color, it's Dago, like, you're going to sell 5,000 tickets, so I need, I need top money for my, for my guy. So we're, we're paying very similar prices as, as any, you know, major festival or, or, you know, Vegas or Miami nightclub, you know? I, and it has definitely affected our, our profitability, you know? But that's, again, where you separate yourself from, from the people that are – the companies that are making it today and the companies that, that stay behind as, as the business evolves. You know, we have to get more creative with, you know, the way we do our production, you know, the artists that we book. You know, we have to be more strategic and make sure we get the right artist, you know. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, our ticket, our ticket price had to go up a little bit, you know. And, and, and it's, yeah, it's one of those things that you battle every day. You know, every day when you're booking a, a big show, you're like, God, like, you look at the budget, you're like, I would love to have this artist and this artist, but, but the budget doesn't allow you anymore, you know? And then, the, and then the game has changed because back in the days when we were Dayglow, our fans didn't care too much who the artist was. If it was a big artist, they would be very happy, but they, it wasn't that important. But now with, like, now with dance music becoming, like, mainstream, and even if you like, like, if, like, like you guys said, like this podcast, you know, even if you go to Idaho, they know, you know, who Tiesto, Cruella, Dada Life, they, they know who, all, who they are, you know, so now you can't just shoot them, you know, anybody and expect to sell five, 10,000 tickets because even though 
they're going to come because they want to experience at that event, they're going to expect you to put, you know, uh, you know, an, an, a, an A level guy or, or, or a B plus guy, and and that makes it difficult when the artist uh, prices keep going up and up and up. You know, it's like at one point, at one point, does it stop? And I don't really see it stopping. You know, so we just gotta we just gotta find ways of, of staying profitable. We, we're having so far a great year right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just it's just keeping up keeping up with the evolution of the business. You know. Cool. Um, Nad wants to know, my friend Nad, he says, Life and Color seem to build for scale from day one based on a clear long-term plan and vision, which obviously you, Sebastian, have already touched on. How did you guys create that plan? <coughs> I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Sorry. How did you guys create that plan? Oh, well, I mean, the, the, the plan wasn't, like, so detailed at the beginning, you know? It was kind of like, here's where we are today. And then we popped up a video of Sensation, and we're like, that's where we need to go, you know? So then that was kind of like the plan. But then we said, okay, so where do we need to go? You know, like, what cities do we need to hit right now to make sure that the whole country hears about us? Um, and then, you know, as it, it was kind of like a, an evolving plan, you know? It, it wasn't too to the T like, okay, we go, to, we go to 10 cities this tour, then next year we hit 15. No, it was kind of like, let's just go to as many as we can. And then once the show started selling out, we just we kept booking as many events as possible that made sense, you know. And then we run into an issue where like, okay, hold on, we booked way too many shows, and <laughs> we're, we're not do, we're not doing it right anymore. So then we pulled back a little bit, and and we strategized and we said, let's go in the right markets on what we believe are the right markets for us, you know. Let's not we don't need to go into six markets in one state. Let's hit the three or four main ones. You know, and, and the main the main market for, for life in color doesn't necessarily mean the biggest city, you know. The main market for us a lot of times means the biggest college, you know, or where we have the most fans, and a lot of times it's not the major cities, you know. But obviously we do like to hit the major cities as well. So it was really an evolving plan. We just it was more of like a defined end goal. Like we wanna be a global brand that does concerts throughout the world in stadiums and we want to bring that unique experience to all of our fans where they walk into life in color and they're like wow I, I've never experienced this before in my life like that was sort of like the definition of like that's our game plan now how are we gonna get there you know yeah we had some obviously long retreats where we planned it out but you know the, the, that plan took so many turns I couldn't even tell you that you know that it's you know it's the plan that we have today but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we we did always have and and then go and and, and I, I, let me tell you that we still like there's still a lot to go for us, you know, and and it's always gonna evolve and it's always gonna get better, um, and we're gonna make mistakes. We still make mistakes all the time, and you know, as long as long as you learn from your mistakes and you tweak your plan, you know, then th then you're good, and 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 that's kind of been that's kind of like how we we design it. It's a very flexible plan. Yeah, flexible is the key word. I think I brought it up on the show before, but. Jay-Z's got this amazing quote, move like water. And right. I really feel like those visions, you know, you go to you go to business school, you're told you have to write a 50 long 50 page long business plan, every detail here and there, but the truth is that these plans are really malleable. You have to respond to the market conditions, you have to respond to what the fans are saying, and you guys have done not only a great job of doing that, but also um, I talk often as well about communication intelligence and the ability to brand across across every touch point. You guys had a live experience, but even down to the way the flyers looked, you guys were some of the first to do proper recap videos. Yeah. You guys were breaking new talent. You know, artists like Rehab broke. I remember the year I started getting into management through Life Thank and you. Color in a big way. Obviously, you helped out with Corella quite a bit as well. I think it's so cool to kind of see that every one of those touch points matter. But in response to Nod, you know, you guys knew where you wanted to be at the end, but there were so many different touch points along the way that would bring you to fruition um, to the eventual sale of SFX, which is obviously not the ending, um, it's just something that's more current, but talk to us a little bit about the process of getting purchased by SFX. Um, it, it was tough, you know, it was a tough decision because we, we like being independent and the whole thought of like corporate world and this and that, it, it's like, it's just not our style, like like anybody in EDM, you know, it's not nobody's style. But then when, when I flew to meet with uh, Bob Sillerman, this, the second I met Bob, I'm like, Oh no! This this is not your regular <clears throat> corporate Wall Street company. This is gonna be like a bunch of badass entrepreneurs that make shit happen. 
that are going to really blow this up out of the water. And, and to be honest, we didn't just sign up to SFX because we knew they could uh, give us resources to continue to grow life in color, but because we actually saw the whole plan of SFX. I don't know if you're aware, but um, myself and Donnie, or Life in Color and, and, and Disco Donnie, were the first companies purchased by SFX. So when, when me and Donnie came into SFX, SFX was just an idea on paper. They didn't even have an office. Like, I sat in a conference room that they let us borrow at the American Idol office in L.A. with, you know, with Bob Sillerman, Shelly Finkel, Mitch Slater, you know, the founders, and they say, guys, this is our plan, you know, and, and what do you guys think? And, and, and they obviously offered us, you know, a, a very fair number for our company. And, and like I said, it, it was more about, like, wow, like, I, what we can do with Life in Color is so big, but what we could do with SFX and, the, and that monster plan to us was just such a bigger, like, life achievement. So that's kind of what, what, why we decided to, to go in, you know? And, and to be honest, let me, let me tell you that I, I will say today it's been the best decision that we've all done in our lives. How come? Being a part of this. What's up? How come? What's well, been? Well, first, okay, well, first off, like, I still feel, and this is when you know you got bought by the right people. I still feel that Life in Color is my company. I still talk about it as my company, and in my heart, it's my company. We 100% keep creative control. They've never in life have said, I don't like that design, I don't like that stage design, why are you booking that artist, why are you throwing that party? Like, we 100% are decision makers, creative makers, I mean, we 100% run our company. And then on top of that, they've actually made a step up our game on the business side, because yeah, mm. I mean, we're, we're Wall Street, you know, so yeah, we gotta, like, the financial planning is to a whole other level now. We make better decisions because we're a little more financially driven now, you know? So it, it was actually a healthy move for the business. And then obviously the resources, you know? Like, we, we expanded into 55 countries, you know? So, I mean, I wouldn't say everything's because of SFX. We were doing that anyways. But the way we're able to position ourselves, our leverage with the local partners, the fact that we have now actually SFX partners in, like, every continent, that we have, you know, local resources. I mean, it's it's endless. And then obviously the fact that I can pick up the pick up the phone and you know coach a guy like Shelly Finkel, you know, who has so many years of knowledge and experience, you know, or a guy like Mitch Slade or even Bob Sillerman, like literally, like that's the type of communication that I have with those guys. So it just shows you that they, 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 it wasn't like how some people might make it seem like, oh, you know, it's just going corporate. No, 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 no. Like this is still our company. And we're still entrepreneurs, and, and, and that's what I love about it. And then obviously, you know, financially, you know, it, it was an amazing change of our lives. So, so but, but 100% it wasn't just the money, because we knew the money was going to come. But it, it, was the, it was, obviously, along with the money, it was honestly making us better businessmen and, and the doors that it has opened up for us as individuals and for life in color. It, it's crazy, man. I couldn't be, begin to tell you how happy we are with those effects. Is global expansion what's next for you guys? Or is there anything yeah. else that's a surprise that we can look forward to? Well, look, there's, there's always surprises to look forward to. Um, there, there's two things. One, like, for example, myself as the CEO, my major focus now is global expansion. Um, I spend half my day every day now working with our international directors because it's not easy to you know, do an event in South Korea on the same weekend as you're doing an event in the U.S. and an event in, like, Colombia, South America. You know, so th it's been like from a logistical side, it's been very difficult, but we've been able to like learn from it and, and we're figuring it out. But then also like, yeah, like making sure that our event is selling internationally just as good as, as nationally. And to be honest, our, our international success right now has been like something that we hoped that it was going to be this good, but we didn't expect that it was going to go this crazy. You know, like we did, you know, 17,000 people in Chile, you know, almost 20,000 people in Puerto Rico. Um, 8,000 people in our first show in Korea, which sold out like in two weeks, you know, um, and, and the list goes on and, and, and how well international is going. So, so yeah, that, that's one of our main things right now is global expansion and putting ourselves across the map. And then the next, the second thing is coming up with the next big innovative thing within our Life in Color pain party, though. We're not trying to veer off too much into like coming up with a whole new concept. That's not, not us right now. It could happen in the future, but not right now. But it is how, like, how do we make Life in Color 2015 
like different than 2014, you know. And we are developing some new things that we think are going to change the game um, that probably won't come until next year. So it, 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 it's a two-part game, you know. It's the global expansion, but at the same time, it's still working on an actual like an actual baby, which is Life in Color, making it the best party in the world. Cool. Well, Sebastian, congratulations to you, your brother you. Lucas and Patrick, for everything, and Paul, sorry, for everything that uh, you guys have done. Really incredible, and I, I'm so glad to have you here on 20 Something Live, and I look forward to seeing that global expansion. Sam here, man. I mean, it was honestly, this was really cool. Your questions were actually like, I mean, I've been to a, quite a few panels, and this is actually <laughs> a really cool one, man. It, it, it was really cool talking to you. Same thing. Congrats to you. I mean, you, you're killing it as well. So, yeah, man, I mean, I, I look forward to speaking to you again and, and hopefully anywhere I can contribute to what you guys are doing, which what I truly admire, I mean, let me know, man. We're here. Thank you, and thank you so much for the support. I really appreciate it. All right. I'm actually heading out to the Jay-Z concert now, so. Enjoy, brother. There he is. I know. I saw it. I saw it. <laughs> Enjoy the show. Thank you, Jake. Cool. All right, guys, shifting gears here. Congratulations to Sebastian. Wow, so incredible to go from starting a business in college to then eventually selling it to a massive company like SFX where you can still retain control. So for everyone out there with a, with a startup that thinks they can't retain control, you can. You just got to find the right partners. And to the book of the week, we have Memos from the Chairman. Um, I thought this was a really funny and interesting book um, where you hear memos from a CEO his company as the company goes through changes. So definitely be sure to pick that one up. All right, moving forward to another group of guys that have pivoted their way into business success. I want to welcome the founders of Recess, my good friends from the same university, my alma mater, Indiana University, go Hoosiers, Jack and Deuce. What's up, guys? Hey, Jake, how's it going? Hey, man, what's up? What's going on? Not a whole lot. How about you? All good, brother. All good. I didn't see you guys at EDM Biz. Where were you? Working. Working. Out here on, uh, out here on the West Coast, plugging away, plugging away for the fall. You guys are off your music tip. You're onto that tech tip, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We're uh, we're still on the music tip, but heard you had a, a really good panel and uh, lots Thank of good you. things coming from that. So congrats on that, dude. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I, I had the pleasure of working with you guys. Um, you welcomed me as a guest on your first, that was the first recess event, correct? Uh, it was year. the second one of the spring tour. Okay, the second one of the spring tour. And it was cool to kind of see some of that Shark Tank flavor sprinkled into what you guys had already started because you're, you know, I know you guys have been go-getters since the very beginning. Deuce, obviously, you were working and doing promotions in college at Bluebird. I think you started in business even before that when we spoke. Jack, you had started, B, uh, what was it, BAA? Yep, yep, BAA. Yeah. BAA down in, in uh, you know, down in Indiana, which basically gave sort of a, a real life, um, real entertainment lifestyle uh, two kids that were still in school that wanted to learn more about what it was going to take to make it entertainment. So you guys started at very young, and then while you were still in school, I remember you guys overtook sort of this theme of, I believe it was the Snoop Dogg show, and your talent, it wasn't about the talent. You guys actually built a brand very similar to our last guest in Sebastian. You guys built a brand. So talk to us a little bit about that, you know, the beginnings of throwing your own shows, how you guys got involved, and then how it's led you guys all the way to recess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, th I think it had started, I interned out in L.A. Uh, the summer after my sophomore year, had the opportunity to go to Hard Fest and, and you know, kind of saw what was happening very early on with, with dance music out, out in Los Angeles and thought, you know, was there an opportunity to create a, a branded festival that could, you know, come out on the college scene and, and had seen this kind of culture at IU of these kind of fraternity parties that were thrown and people would kind of reinvent the wheel every year and it was all about the talent and the headliner and so, you know, was able to connect with Deuce and, and we kind of came together and said, hey, is there, you know, a way to create a brand so that year after year you wouldn't have to start from scratch, you know, it could build some credibility um, and you wouldn't have to work as hard, you know, year after year and, and you know, at the time, Dance music in, in the Midwest. Start, the first show we booked was uh, was LMFAO and Mike Posner back in the day, um, which was which was funny, and, and followed it up the, the following year with Pretty Lights. But it was just kind of when when Girl Talk was getting popular in Indiana, and and 
kind of the early stages of, of everything of, of where we are now. And then, and then the same thing as, as, you know, what Sebastian said, like, you know, we wanted to be, you know, throwing events where it was all about, like, the party. Like, it wasn't very, like, talent-driven. Like, you know, we was going to be this awesome event with, like, huge production and a big party and everyone was going to have fun. Like, that was, you know, that was our main focus starting out. Cool. And then how did you guys, obviously, this un teaching the schools what Glowfest was all about was a difficult task. Because mm -hmm. uh, you guys, unlike Sebastian, rather than going and doing your private church, you guys wanted to partner with the schools. Mm -hmm. It was always very important for you guys to partner with the schools. You guys have both served on different boards at the university. You guys knew what the power was in partnering with the schools. So when that didn't happen, you kind of stepped back. And I think it's cool, too, that you guys stayed partnered despite those failures, which have now led you to the beginnings of your success with Recess. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, what, what? How did you guys decide to step back from Glowfest and say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna start with this recess thing? You know, I think it was. You know, we we probably did close to twenty shows under the Glowfest brand at at campuses all over the country. Um, and you know, the way that our business model worked at the time, we were going out raising you know private financing for each one of our tours. We would partner with student groups on campus that would get us onto campus and allow us to throw these shows, but. It was a struggle, you know, with the name Glowfest and, and bringing acts like, you know, Sebastian and Grosso and Avicii, you know, to college campuses back in 2008. I mean, it's still a struggle today, um, and, and colleges still have this kind of negative connotation to dance music, um, but it, it was much harder back then, and, and we kind of, even in 2012, had started to kind of incorporate, you know, bringing different startups to our show and, and using that as an opportunity to give them exposure. But we were running into this wall, you know, with the name Glowfest attached to it. Um, and, it and, and for whatever reason, unfortunately, you know, it's funny, we, we would often very much get confused with, uh, with Sebastian's concept. We'd have to be like, no, there's, there's no pain involved. It's, you know, it's just a concert. Um, and, and even still, we ran into to struggles with, with universities. Um, and, and for us, we knew that, you know, we, we really saw this, this model of kind of fusing together you know, entrepreneurship and, and education and entertainment together, and, and that's new. We knew that's where we wanted to head, and we knew that you know the Glowfest name w was not going to get us there. Because um, even talking with with different partners, it just it, it it was a roadblock for us, unfortunately. So it was you know similar kind of feeling and, and struggles to what Sebastian and felt about about changing the name, um, but you know was was ultimately you know the best decision we could have made for for what we were trying to do as a brand. And I think, like, you know, after going and, and touring all these colleges and talking with all these college students and seeing, like, you know, the struggles that they were dealing with, you know, coming out of school and, and not having a job and, um, you know, it was, it was, like, literally, like, the, the, the entrepreneurship explosion on, on colleges. Like, you know, the social network had just came out. Like, you know, Shark Tank was starting to get big. And, and you know, the cool kids on campus had started being these kids, you know, with startups. And it was, you know, it was the same thing that we saw a couple of years before when, when dance music started getting really big on colleges. So, you know, we we were trying to figure out, like, you know, what our kind of secret sauce was or what our, you know, set us apart from, from everyone else. And, and you know, once, once we kind of figured out this entrepreneurship angle, like, we knew, you know, that was kind of, like, our secret sauce and, and what made us different. And so what's going to – what's recess going to be next year? Because this year it was kind of – it was a concert component – Mixed with this entrepreneurial panels, and it ended with some with a Shark Tank contest, um, and then it was a national contest that occurred what a couple of weeks ago in Las Vegas, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, think, I, mean, I think the plan is to kind of you know continue that. Uh, we bring you know we bring a bunch of startups that are interested in like meeting you know students to either recruit or, or you know activate them on campus. Uh, you know, bringing entrepreneurs like yourself and, and having them come and speak to students sharing their stories about, you know, the struggles that they overcame and, and, you know, what it takes to be successful, you know, and I think one thing that we're super excited about and, and especially coming out of Vegas, like, you know, giving, you know, student startups the opportunity to come out and, and pitch their business and connect them with investors and mentors and advisors and, and really, like, you know, support these these student startups. Like, we were, a, you know, we started our business when we were in Indiana and it was, like, really hard, you know, and we had a lot of shit that we had to overcome and, and you know, we got lucky and shot, you know, mark a blind email and got lucky. So, like, we want to, like, pay it forward and help, you know, other startups and, and make it easier for them. But, yeah, it's still doing kind of the educational stuff during the day, you know, and then, like, the concerts at night to celebrate. And I know you guys worked very hard to not only find those mentors but also those investors and 
you just shot out a first name. I'm not sure everyone knows exactly uh, what you're referring to, so let's dig into it. Um, you have investors, though, such as Mark Cuban and also Stephanie LaFera, correct, who manages Cascade? Yeah, Stephanie uh, was like basically our first advisor. Um, you know, we, we met her, I think, I think over maybe it was two years ago at the first uh, EDM Biz, um, and connected mm -hmm. with her there and kind of shared what we were trying to do. Uh, you know, kind of about pivoting Glowfest into Recess and bringing together these elements of, of using music to kind of inspire you know entrepreneurs and, and give them a, a larger platform. She really connected with it and, and, and got it right away and, and has been, you know, one of our, our closest advisors since then. So, and, and yeah, Mark, we, uh, you know, similar, you know, both both coming from Indiana, it was, uh, he was kind of the guy that always got talked about in, in business school and, you know, sophomore year finance class and, the, you know, they'd say Mark Cuban, you know, they'd always reference him as, as kind of the, the, the star to come out of our business school. So, um, you know, we, we saw that he had partnered with, Live Nation and AEG on, on Access TV and has, has obviously been, you know, pre, even pre-Shark Tank had, had been investing in lots of different companies. So when we had initially started the concept of bringing this startup career fair on tour, um, found his, his email off the Dallas Mavericks website, shot him a blind email and, and, you know, put Indiana University startup in the subject line to hopefully flag his attention and just said, hey, Mark, you know, would, would you be interested in sending any of your startups on tour with us and you know it's a great platform for them to get out there whether they're looking to drive users or recruit or you know any number of those reasons and we didn't hear from them for probably a week and then got an email back at one o'clock in the morning saying you know I'm, I'm not interested in putting any startups on tour but I'm interested in investing um, and after we caught our breath and and kind of settled down from that initial shock uh, continued the conversation with him and shared our vision of, of, you know, where we wanted to take it and what we wanted to do. And, and uh, you know, I think he's definitely, from what you see on Shark Tank, is, is, is definitely very interested in the live space and how, you know, experiential properties, you know, can't really be replicated. Um, they can't be, you know, pirated and, or copyrighted in that sense. And so he saw something in, in, you know, our concept and where we wanted to go. And we were lucky enough that he was, he was our first investor that, that came on and, and has really helped us take our company to the next level um, from from the mentorship to his accessibility to the intros he's made um, it's it's really made you know all the difference for us cool so what can is there gonna be a fall tour there is yeah we will uh, probably in the next two or three weeks be looking for an announcement um, which we're, we're really excited about and I you know to Deuce's point earlier I think the the evolution that, that where we're heading is is how can we fuse, you know, the nighttime concert and the artists in with the educational elements during the day um, in, in a in a you know more fluid way. You know, whether it's integrating the artists into panels or, or you know speaking concepts or even uh, featuring them on the you know the pitch competition panel and, and having them you know give their feedback and, and talking with students about these business ideas. So that's um, you know we well, that's the model that we're really working on refining. Uh, for this next fall tour. How many schools do you plan to go to in the fall? Probably, probably looking at doing like 10 and then uh, and then doing, you know, spring again and really, really probably ramping it up in spring to do, you know, over, you know, 20 or 25. Cool. Very awesome. And, and I, the pivot that you guys made from Glowfest to Recess, I'm sure made it that much easier to pitch to schools, but talk to us a little bit about getting shut down and how you have to revise your pitch and and what it took to finally get something now. Is it a lot easier now? And, and you guys must be experts at it at this point because you've been selling shows for three or four years now. It's, it's infinitely easier. <laughs> it, <laughs> is, much, it, much easier. it is night and day now, so it's been, it's been good. And, I mean, it took, it took a minute to, like, refine the pitch and, and get it down. Like, like Jack was, like, saying earlier, like, when, you know, when it was Glowfest and it was, like, you know, you know, trying to come in and, you know, throw this EDM event on campus, like, you go to like the 40 year old woman advisor and she's like, you know, absolutely not. Like this is not happening. Like, you know, the university is not paying for this. Like we're not welcoming this on our campus. But now when we go there, it's like, you know, we're bringing all these opportunities and resources, you know, that are, you know, that aren't really on college campuses. So, mm. you know, they're much more like welcoming and an opening of it. And, you know, we partner with like the business schools and the entrepreneurship programs and career services departments and, you know, incubators and accelerators on campus. So it's like, you know, not only are they, you know, welcoming us onto the campus, but they're, like, spreading our event and encouraging, you know, students and other departments and, and organizations to get involved, which is, 
you know, which has been all the difference, you know, for us. And what's your advice to those in college? Like I, I mentioned at the beginning of our segment here together, you guys were very involved, always on campus. Do so. Were you president of the union board? One of the presidents of the union board? I did. Uh, I did the business careers and entertainment club, like music committee. Okay, and you were the head of that, Jack. Yeah. You started your entirely own, you know, club. Um, so, how important was you know the college experience, to you guys? And what's your advice to those in college now? that are looking to get involved in entertainment, what's what's the best place to start? I mean, it's just, just going out and doing it. Like, you know, we had such an awesome group of people at Indiana. Like, I think the whole thing was just getting out there and, and trying and, you know, doing stuff. Like, I started with a, a nonprofit music festival. Jack started with a campus movie festival. And, like, that's, you know, those were the first major events that we, that we went out and did on our own. And, you know, that was each of us saying, like, I've got a vision for doing something. Like, I'm going to do whatever it takes, you know, to make that happen and just going out there and doing it. And along the way, like, met a ton of awesome people. Like, now, you know, there's so many awesome contacts and relationships that we, you know, made in college. You know, people like you and, uh, you know, Will Runzel and, you know, there's so many people that we just made connections with in college. And you really don't realize, you know, how much those connections actually matter until you graduate and you continue to, like, foster those and, and lean on those. But I feel like, you know, everyone that went to Indiana, we're in this, like, family and, like, everyone wants to help each other. So just getting out there and, and doing it, you know, as much as you can and starting small and, you know, raising the bar a little bit each time and, and just, you know, just just doing something. Just don't sit there. I think I think the the important thing to remember too is that, you know, the the university is is your customer to some extent too. Or, you know, it, you're paying the university to go to school there. You're paying the tuition. So, you know, there are resources at every school, um, budgets that are available for students that you know, want to start things or be creative, like in Indiana, you know, we have the, the Coca-Cola fund, and it was, you know, essentially a, the dean had a discretion to kind of fund different activities throughout the year, so, you know, being entrepreneurial within your own campus, being able to find, you know, funding and resources to throw events and kind of organize those own things, you know, that's a, a skill, and, and that's something that students, you know, I would encourage everybody to kind of dig a little deeper and see, you know, what opportunities they're there, and and, you know, on the, the, the mentorship side of things, I think, you know, some of the best advice that we heard from some of the speakers on our tour was to leverage your age, you know, and, and mm. there's no better time than in college to, like, Jake, I know, I think you still say you do it even now is just sending blind emails to people every week, um, you know, asking for advice or to connect with them. There's, there's no better time to do that than the four years in college because, you know, if, if you reach out to somebody and, and they blow you off, you know, that, you know, that that's whatever. But, but, you know, probably I'd say eight times out of ten, if you ask honestly, you know, hey, I'm thinking about doing this, do you have any advice or feedback, people are much more willing to do so um, coming from a college student. Um, and, and there's really, there's no better time in, in those four years to try something, start something. And, and even if you fail, um, you know, if you're lucky enough to have, you know, your, your parents supporting you during college, then, you know, you should take advantage of those four years and, and, and try and start something. Definitely. Networking's everything, and I think that the way I'm so intrigued by the way you guys tailored your request to Mark is if you don't have Indiana University startup in that upper subject line, who knows whether he ever opens up that email. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, one of the like, best pieces of advice that, that you know, that, that we've got from, you know, someone even younger than us was, was Corey Levy that came on tour and and spoke on every date, and, you know, he's, he gives this piece of advice in his speech. He says, you know, one, leverage your age, but, like, when you're trying to reach out to these big people, like, you know, whenever you ask for advice, you get money, and whenever you ask for money, you get advice. So that's something that we've, you know, we literally use that more than anything, and, and you know, it's, it's proven time and time again, and, and, you know, I would, that's, you know, I would share that with everyone. Cool, and are you guys still in the process? I know that at one point there was talks of creating a, a larger multimedia platform, is that still in the works? Because I know that, that was it was sort of like a, a, another division of the company for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, side business of, of kind of what we do with our tour, we, we represent a number of uh, web properties, different blogs that I'm sure a lot of your, your you know listeners would know. We help them monetize their site and sell their advertising. So we're, uh, you know, we, we've got a couple of campaigns coming up that, that'll launch in the fall, but but... You know, I think whether it's, you know, SFX or Live Nation, you know, a lot of these bigger companies are trying to figure out how do we merge, you know, digital and experiential, you know, in unique ways to create opportunities for brands. So we're, uh, we're following that, that same train of thought, just doing it on a, a much more targeted focus level on, on the college demographic. Um, so working with publishers that may skew 18 to 24, 
um, and we have our property, you know, our touring property that, that focuses on the college demographic. So, you know, I, I think ultimately it's, it's just about providing value, you know, value for sponsors that might be coming in that are looking to, you know, reach a, a certain demographic or a millennial audience, providing value for the students coming to our shows and, and our events and value for the universities as well. Um, and if you, you, you kind of figure out the right medium of, of providing value to all three of those people, that, that's kind of where the sweet spot is for us. Definitely. Well, Jack and Deuce, good luck on your guys' fall tour. Congratulations on not only the investments you've got, but I think the way that this past tour was received, which was just incredible. And I think that a lot of people in college, they need to know what entrepreneurship means today. I mean, I don't talk about it much on this show, but some people may know I'm writing a book called 20-something. And really, it's about redefining entrepreneurship. Deuce, you said something a few minutes ago. You said, go, go do something. Start something. you know. And it's like either in this world, whether you're starting your own business or not, because I think that's the key differentiator, because a lot of people don't understand that the term entrepreneur, it's taking on a new meaning, right? I don't think you have to start a business anymore to be an entrepreneur. And it's either you're doing something or you're a drone, right? You're either like one of the two. And I think that a lot of people out there, they shouldn't be intimidated by that word. It's really not, uh, it's not an actual, it's not about getting an LLC or taking your idea and getting a web domain. I think it's just about doing something, starting somewhere because that experience that you get and, and all the times you guys were pitching Glowfist has led you to this point now with Recess where, like you said, it's become that much easier to pitch. And I think you guys are onto something really successful. So congratulations on that. Cool. Thank you, man. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. All right, guys, in closing out here, the track of the day today is Ryan Weaver's Octahate. It's a really dope indie pop tune from a girl. I haven't really got to find out much about her. She only got like one picture on her Facebook, but it's spelled R-Y-N space Weaver. It was sent to me by my good friend Brett Bassick. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us on 20-something Live. I will see you next week.